Welcome to the showcase. We have a wonderful program here today. The book of Jude of the Bible. You know that one that's right before Revelations <laughs> that hides? Well, my guest today, Pastor John Coleman, is also a philosophy teacher, and he's going to be giving us great ideas and thoughts out of the book of Jude. Pastor John Coleman, thank you for being here this evening. John, thanks for inviting me. I'm so glad to be on the showcase. Wonderful. Now, we were coming in and we we're talking about the book of Jude. Yes. Could you give us some insight before we start about the book of Jude? It's a great book, John, because what the book does is, is that it clearly identifies the characteristics of the false teacher, especially in Christianity. When Christianity falls on hard times, the Christian is to look at the book of Jude to analyze what kind of pastor they have, what kind of religious leader they have. And so what I've done is I've gained out of the book uh, 16 themes that run throughout the entire book. And I preach uh, this particular sermon that I'm using from my notes some many years ago, John, mm -hmm. and it's just as lively today because of the, ch the churches have fallen on the rocks of hard times. False doctrine has taken over the church. Wow. And I see we're going to do it by analysis, by way of exposition. We must do it that way, John, because when you look at the book, when you look at the Bible, if you do not give an expositional review of what you're studying, then you have to come off the top of your head. Mm -hmm. Then it's your ideas. Mm -hmm. It's your opinion mm -hmm. as opposed to God's opinion. So that's why whenever you do any type of preaching from the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament, mm -hmm. you must do it expositionally. That's mm -hmm. where you take the meaning of the text and you expositorily break it down and so that the listener can know exactly what God is saying to them. Well, let me ask this question. All righty. The false teachers you speak of, yes. would you say they're doing exposition or they're not doing exposition? Well, they are doing eisegesis instead of exegesis <laughs> because, you see, what happens is that when you do um, uh, eisegesis, what you do is you put your idea into the text and make God work for you. Okay. Let me speak to the viewing audience. Okay, please. And I have to speak with you as a college professor would. If you attended a university and you went there and you were studying philosophy, you would expect that first semester philosophy teacher to take you through Aristotle, Plato, to take you through some reasoning, some logic, to take you through uh, Anselm's teleological design of knowing what truth is. Why should we handle the Bible or the Word of God in any other way? So I believe, John, here again, that the false teacher, mm -hmm. the one that is in the church, okay. that is pretending to be the real, that's the one that has brought the danger in the church itself today. Okay, and I see here in your outline that you have 16 themes identified. Yes, and the first theme is false teaching. Okay. And I believe, John, that this heads the gamut. You see... What would you expect of the devil if you wanted to destroy the body of Christ? The first thing that he would have to do mm -hmm. is to put a certain particular type of teaching in the person that goes to church to take that person away from the absolute truth of God's word. Okay. What better way to do it than to put a false teacher in that position to trick the people of God, especially if they are not learned in the very word of God. Now, let me add this, John, okay. and it's very important. I wear this collar and I wear this cross and all this because I want to be identified who I am. When I drive up and down the street, when I get out of my car to go into the store, they know that I'm a bishop in the church. Okay. This cross signifies that Christ died for my sins and that I'm, I'm supposed to live in a way that is uh, indicative of Christ. Okay. Now, what if I'm in the supermarket, John, <laughs> and fancy lady comes in or fancy guy comes in and I pinch him on the, the derriere? With this on, it identifies me as a false teacher. Okay. And so that's why I believe that Jude points this out in the beginning of the book. Wow, I see the second idea is ungodliness. Oh, yeah, that identifies the person's lifestyle, John, mm -hmm. because the false teacher is ungodly. We get confused a lot because we like to say, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. He may not know doctrine like John does. Okay. Uh, he may not be a college professor. He may not have an earned master's degree in theology, mm -hmm. but he has a good heart. But no, you have to understand that if his lifestyle is ungodly, and what I mean by that, you got the church setting in front of you. Right. They're struggling in marriages. They're struggling to financially make it mm -hmm. work. 
but the false teacher is driving a Bentley, John, okay. a Bentley okay. to church every week, and the people are living in the inner city saying, oh, praise the bishop, when they ought to say, why doesn't the bishop sell his Bentley and help out the people in the church? And so this ungodliness is identified in their lifestyles. Does that reflect or is that assimilated by the parishioners that are sitting up under this false teacher. If he has a prosperity gospel that says that you can have what I have, but John, oh. if you know anything about logic, I think I better talk to the people again, all right? Just okay. let me talk to Please. them. Now look here. Y'all listen to this bishop. You want a Bentley? Get a job, get a life. Y'all can say it with the pastor. Get a job, get a life. Now let me go back to John. Listen, ungodliness says, all you need to do is touch it like I'm touching this cup. Uh -huh. Name it and claim it in the name of Jesus. And oh, praise God, it's going to happen. The victory sign. We're not in England. We aren't fighting a world war. And the devil's not concerned about you driving a Bentley or taking a bus. Okay. Why is the bishop? So uh, that's why I would say ungodliness. Okay. All and right. our next subject is permissiveness and lust. Oh, Ooh. yes. Because listen, listen, listen. When you're a false teacher and you're ungodly, what comes next? Whatever you say goes. Uh -huh. That's when they come to you and say, well, God has told me last night that my wife has to co-pastor with me. Okay. That's permissiveness. In other words, you can permit anything. Uh -huh. What does the Bible say about female pastors? Does the Bible affirm them? Well, the Lord is doing a new, new thing, thing. Okay. permissiveness and lust. Why would he want his wife to co-pastor, lusting for the stuff in the church? Mm -hmm. Who owns the building? Whose name is it in? Do the parishioners have anything to say about it? And so when this kind of attitude comes into the church mm -hmm. and the bishop has that kind of power, then the bishop has turned into corruption. Permissiveness and lust is the third deadly theme in the church today. Well, I see these are progressing from the top <laughs> Or the head, shall I say, oh, yeah. on down. Oh, John, wait a minute. Let's stop playing with this. Mm -hmm. Man, listen, you know how many people are pastor. That's yeah. not important to the viewing audience. Mm -hmm. But it is less than 100. You know that this bishop doesn't need 200 people to give him a...